you know, I'm talking a lot about the theory of evolution from uh, um, Darwin's point of view, but let me give you the Vedic perspective. So, over the course of time, Brahma, he has the seedling forms of all the different living entities within him and within the lotus flower and the lotus stem that are coming from uh, Garvadakshaya Vishnu. Brahma creates by his mind. He's able to create actual physical living entities through meditation, and it doesn't require any sexual act. So, using his mental powers, he creates Vayam Bhuvamanu and his wife, and they actually took up residence on planet Earth. And from them, they generated all types of plants and animals. At, and this was approximately, if we go by the Vedic time scale, tracing out all the different Manus, this was approximately 2 billion years ago. And at this time, 2 billion years ago, modern science says that there was only algae and bacteria living on the Earth. But the Vedic perspective is in direct opposition to that, that Brahma was creating, he had already uh, created different types of plants and animals, and then the Manus were created in order to progenerate the different types of men. So I'm going to give you a more detailed description of the process by which the Manus create. So Brahma's original creation is taking, part, taking place in the upper planetary systems, such as Satya Loka. Um, these are the topmost planetary systems, or uh, above planet Earth. And then the different Manus that he creates take up residence on different planets, as I explained that the Svayam Bhuva Manu, he took up residence on planet Earth. The different Manus have to uh, create repeatedly because at the, the end of their lives there's devastation that takes place by the encroachment of the causal ocean and uh, this causal ocean rises becomes agitated and there is a devastation that takes place as we see in the natural cycles of planet earth that there's creation and devastation each manu then takes over the process of creation again so we are now in the seventh manu period of Vivisvat Manu, and this is the 28th millennium of his 71 or 72 millenniums that he will rule for. We're in the 28th millennium of... So the description that I'm going to give is the 6th Manu, the one previous to this that's given in, in the Vedic perspective in the Bhagavatam, of Chakshusha Manu. And this is a detailed explanation of the origin of species uh, according to the Vedic perspective. So after the devastation of the previous era, there were no human beings on Earth, but there were some vegetation, there were some trees, some creepers like that. In order to avoid the devastation, some great yogis called the Prachetas, who were the sons of King Prachini Barisat, they were within the ocean, which this may have some connection to some theories in Atlantis, but uh, we can discuss that and explore that in further shows. But the Prachetas were because of their great meditation and yogic powers, were able to remain within the water of planet Earth and not be affected by the devastation. And at a certain point after the uh, floods receded, which in every ancient knowledge wisdom system, whether it be American Indian or Vedic or Egyptian or uh, Mesopotamian, that there is all an account of a great flood, but the Prachetas come out after the flood, after being safe within the, but uh, due to their meditational powers within the oceans. And they see that the entire earth is covered with dense forest and dense trees. And they start to, in order to make some residences, they start to, with their yogic powers, create fires that burn down the trees so that they're clearing the land for future agriculture, etc. But they get a little bit carried away. So, um, Brahma and Soma, who is the moon god, induced them to stop, that they've cleared enough land and that actually there's an important living entity within some of the forests that they may harm if they uh, continue uh, burning away all the forests of the earth. Okay, so the, they find this young girl that is living within the forest called Maricha. She's the daughter of an Aspara or an he a heavenly being that's been left on planet earth to be She's being taken care of by the different presiding deities of the earth. There's presiding deities of the trees, of the water, of the air. The Vedic perspective points out that there is life and that there is a personality behind everything that we see, including the clouds, the trees, the water. So this daughter of the Aspara was living within the forest of the earth, uh, being tended to by the predominating deities of the earth. And even Mother Earth herself is, has a, a personal form. She was given to the Prachetas uh, to be their wife. 
And from her and the mating of the Prachetas come the incarnation of Prajapati Daksha. Prajapati means progenitor of mankind. He was a, in a previous incarnation, he was the direct son of Brahma, but due to some offenses that he created to Lord Shiva, he became embroiled and entangled in a very difficult situation. But this is the incarnation of that same personality, Daksha. Daksha is the Prajapati, or the primary creator of the different living entities uh, for this generation that we're talking, in the sixth Manu period. First, Daksha tried to create by using just his mind, uh, as Lord Brahma does, but he was not up to equal to that task and uh, found that his creations were not quite right and that uh, things weren't going very well with creating with just the mind. So he executed, then he uh, went to the Vindhya mountain range and executed difficult austerities for a very long time. Um, one of the austerities that he was performing was that he recited the Hamsa Guya prayers to Lord Vishnu. Uh, eventually, because of the Hamsa Guya prayers to Lord Vishnu, Lord Vishnu appeared and gave uh, Prajapati Daksha the benediction of a wife to produce large numbers of offspring. He first produced with his wife 10,000 Hari Ashvas, who um, the great sage Narada, who was able to travel throughout all the universes, whether they be material or spiritual, he came and converted the 10,000 Hari Ashvas to be celibate monks, which was um, really upsetting to Prajapati Daksha because the idea of having uh, so many children to 10,000 Hari Ashvas was that they would become family men and then start to create. So after Narada converted the 10,000 Hari Ashvas, then he produced 1,000 uh, other sons, the Sapulastas, and Narada came again and converted them to not progenerate with uh, the, the different forms of life, uh, that they would also be converted to be celibate monks and to concentrate on spiritual realization. Daksha is really upset at this point, and he decides to produce daughters. The thought that Narada will not interfere with the daughters. Of course, that led to Narada's Daksha cursing Narada, that Narada could not remain in any place for more than three days. But actually, Narada enjoyed that curse because he enjoyed traveling and spreading transcendental knowledge to all the different regions of the material universe. He took the curse to actually be a benediction that he would be able to travel. So the question may be, well, if you're just producing sons or daughters, well, who are you going to mate with? Well, um, the devastation that takes place at the end of Amanu only occurs up to the earthly planet, the flood. So the demigods of the higher regions of the heavenly planets and the upper planetary systems are still existing. So those are the mates for the either the sons or daughters of Daksha. So here we have Maricha is also an, uh, the daughter of Asparas who are from upper planetary systems. So in that sense considered to be extraterrestrial in today's modern lingo. We have Daksha. And now the daughters of Daksha are going to be mating with the different demigods who also can be considered extraterrestrial. So, you know, a lot of people are going back to the Mesopotamian and all this and the Sumerian and, and, and it always comes out that, you know, through Zachariah Sitchin and so many people that human, human DNA has been manipulated to be a slave race and all this. But actually that's misinformation. That mostly when we, the, the influence of the extraterrestrials are through demigods and that this is how the human race is actually created through this type of interaction. And it's not always some horrible thing where people are being enslaved and blah, blah, blah. Actually, many times it's actually, you know, this is for the benefit of mankind. This is the creation of mankind. We would not exist without the different influences of the different extraterrestrials or demigods or asparas, etc., who uh, are actually the, they are the progenitors of mankind. And again, that uh, the different offspring from the daughters in the mating of the demigods, they become elemental forces or the deities behind the elemental forces such as clouds, time, uh, even there are different presiding deities that are in charge of the different cities as we used to see in the past uh, in Europe that each city had a patron saint that uh, was in charge of the different cities. And so this is the idea that the unification of the daughters of Daksha and the demigods produce different powerful living entities that are presiding deities behind the different all the elemental forces that we see whether they be clouds or rivers or trees so everything in the Vedic perspective is personal
daughters of Daksha who mate with the different demigods, they give birth to different types of living entities, including birds, beasts, vegetation, angels, rakshashas, who are demons. There is actually, in the Vedic literature, a list of the species who were born from the wombs of the daughters of Daksha. So, there is not only do they give birth to different types of uh, men and mankind and women, but also they give birth to birds, beasts. So one may question, well, how is this possible? Um, how can these living entities give birth to so many different types of species? So the answer is that the children are not ordinary children. That they can, and the demigods themselves are not ordinary. They're they're from the upper planetary systems. And just as with Brahma had all the seedling forms of all the different living entities within him, then as it becomes broken down into different demigods in the universal order, that the demigods have different proportions of seed, seedling forms within them in their genetics, that they are able to produce more than just one type of living entity, that they can produce many types of living entities. And finally, when it gets down to the earthly form or our form, we only have one seed or one genetic code within us to create one type of being. But as we go up the universal scale, as the different living entities become more and more powerful, they have more and more seedling forms within them that they can produce. The, these personalities who have the bloodlines of the demigods and are great personalities, the progenitors of mankind, that not only do they have the different seedling forms within them, but that they can take different types of forms. Uh, for example, they can use their mind, like this, this Yami demigoddess, she was actually a mare that was roaming planet Earth and she was able to produce the Ashvini Kumars, who are the physicians of the heavenly planets. So, not only can they produce and have the seeds within them to produce different types of living entities, but also they can take different forms of different living entities, so that uh, progeny may be born of that type of form that they take. Just like with us, sometimes we may have an idea within our mind, and then through some great effort, that idea becomes manifest on the physical in the physical world. It's the same idea here, only the living entities are much more powerful, but when they have some idea in their mind, let's say, for example, Yami wants to take the form of a horse to roam planet Earth, that these things are immediately done through their powers.